Will you pray with me, please? We are thankful, loving God, to be in the presence of one another and thereby in your presence, to be in your presence and with one another. We are thankful for this opportunity and moment of worship when our hearts and minds are joined together with the spirit that you have conveyed since the beginning of creation. We pray, loving God, that in this time we know how much we are loved. And we know that you are with us, that you anoint us for growth and healing in our lives, that you are with us on the eternal journey that began so long ago and begins again in this very moment. We pray, loving God, that as we are in this place, we will have in our hearts the prayer of the psalmist who prayed, that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The Olympics caught my attention in momentary grabs and much admiration over the past two weeks. Now, I'm not the greatest sports fan in any of the areas of competition. I don't know much about it, to be honest. But I am smitten with the hallelujahs of competition when underdogs win. And, and, the, and Olympiad fans are surprised by the grace and skill of a young, aspirational person flourishing on the global stage. Historians tell us that the first written records of the ancient Olympic Games date back to 776 BC, 800 years before Jesus walked in the land. At that time, on that record, a humble cook named Corobus of Elis won the only event, a 210-yard foot race, to become the very first recorded Olympic champion. It is generally believed that the games had been going on for many years before that. The ancient Olympics were held every four years in late summer during a religious festival honoring Zeus. In 393 of the Common Era, 300 years after Jesus walked the earth, almost 100 years after the Nicene Creed and the expansion of Christianity, Theodosius I was the emperor, and he was a Christian, and he called for the ban of all pagan festivals. And that ended the Olympic tradition after nearly 12 centuries. Sometimes Christians just can't leave well enough alone. <laughs> we're glad to know that the Olympics were revived in 1896. And I don't know how closely those of us here today follow the games, but reporting on them has been hard to miss. So I imagine most of us picked up on some of the actions and personalities with interest. One headline I read called these the Transformational Olympics. It was a story about the progress people were making as societal barriers were being broken along with athletic records. Locally, a native of Desert Hot Springs named Sarah Robles earned the bronze medal in women's 75 kilogram and up competition last Sunday in Rio. She became the first American to win a weightlifting medal, man or woman, since the year 2000. Nationally, this Olympics is transformational as young black American women rose to mighty prominence. There is not time enough for me to mention all of them, but I have two for you. Simone Manuel captured gold and became the first black woman to medal in swimming. She and a teammate made this year's team be the first U.S. swim team to boast two black women. That is wonderful, given our sad history of racially segregated swimming pools and beaches, 
Pools and beaches that were abandoned by white patrons when blacks came to swim. And public pools that were drained, in one case, after a black woman stuck her toe in the water. And in another case, at a motel, uh, sprinkled in the water while black persons were swimming, um, the acid was put in the water. <coughs> Let me just say to you on that, that the water diluted the acid so much that it was an action that speaks louder than words or had the effect. But still, that's something that was done to get the black people out of the pool. So you can see how this winning of the gold was a big deal. In another spirit, Ibtahaj Muhammad won the individual bronze and team bronze in fencing. And she is the first American athlete to both compete and medal, wearing the hijab coverings of her Muslim faith. Now in other ways of celebration, there were marriage proposals between a lesbian couple and a gay male couple that became public. In some events, both gay and lesbian athletes had spouses and partners in the stands that not in every situation, but in several situations, they got better at this as the two weeks went along, that the media recognized their partners and spouses in the same way for gay and lesbian people as for heterosexual people. It was noted by some news outlets that there were more out gay athletes in these games than ever before. Among all the good times, there were some rough times, too. Like when the Egyptian judo athlete would not shake hands with the Israeli, who, he had, who had just won the match between them. And there is some news about an American male swimmer, or two, or three, or five, hmm. that I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> it seems to me that these were the most consequential Olympics for human society, sociological advancement since black Jesse Owens won a gold medal for track in front of Aryan race progenitor Adolf Hitler. A colleague and friend of mine who was a competitive swimmer in her youth posted on Facebook that the celebration of the women winning gold is a manifestation of the long-term positive results of the Title IX legislation from 1972 that was put forth by a certain senator from Indiana. It made it into national law that federal dollars had to be used equally for women as well as men in public sports programs, public school sports programs. Now this is a system for good. It was the establishment of a system for good put in place many years ago to ensure equitable financial responsibility and to nurture and promote participation of women in competitive athletics. And it has produced the kinds of success that we are seeing now manifest in 2016 in the Olympics because women were ensured equal access and freedom to excel. Now there was also a system experienced that is persistent and restrictive in our culture when events are playing out even in another country. One writer pointed out in an online column that according to the ways, of our, the ways that our culture presents things, gymnast Gabby Douglas disrespected her entire country by not putting her hand on her heart for the national anthem and not smiling enough during the Olympics. Yet, swimmer Ryan Lochte and his teammates were acting like kids and who deserve a break after vandalizing property and lying about a traumatic robbery. The writer says, just in case, and I agree with the writer, just in case we were wondering what white male privilege looks like, <laughs> That was it. Now please know that I know there are many factors that are in play in these comparative situations. But the fact of white male privilege as a system in our culture remains. And I think our gospel reading today encourages us to be aware of these systems that can be restrictive influences in our society. And our faithful calling is to do what we can to counteract them. 
In our gospel reading today, Jesus gets in trouble with the religious authorities because he heals a woman on the Sabbath. This passage carries with it the conventional wisdom in our day that um, that's, that's the way that it's taught. Jesus got in trouble because he healed a woman on the Sabbath. It was against the law. Now the Sunday school lesson from this story is usually concluded with the encouragement to not let religion hinder us from doing good in our society. There's a lot more to it, but that's the Sunday school version. It is clear that early Christian writers presented Jesus as a healer. It is at the same time true that Jesus was not the only one either claiming the role of being a healer or being described as such back in those days. Prior to the understanding of chemistry, of modern science, and of medicine, the practice of medical arts in ancient days was way more iffy than it is even today, and it's still pretty iffy today. In those days, before aspirin, anesthesia, antiseptics, antibiotics, and Botox, the treatment of physical maladies and ailments was by potions, prayer, and endurance. So imagine the impact of hearing a story that presents a woman with a debilitating, and I was worried about the names of the people that I was doing. The debilitating physical ailment for 18 years being healed in an instant. Word would spread quickly, and the healer's reputation would rise substantially. That's the reason for a gospel story like this, and it's been used for ages to raise Jesus' stature. So we are more likely to trust in this impressive character for healing in our own lives. And there's nothing wrong with that, and there can be lots of good in that. That is, until we know someone who prays for healing from Jesus and their condition does not change. Then what? That's a question for all of us to ponder close to our hearts and something that I'll talk about at another time. Today I want to share with you that I think we live in a day when we have to look back at these Bible stories and understand that in some cases they were more metaphorically intentioned than reality based. I think an offer for consideration that the woman in today's story was put in the picture as a symbol of all the oppressive forces pressing down on the ancient society by religious law, foreign domination, grassroots rebellion, and the unjust economics of the time. The woman by her gender and condition was not valued by any of the prevailing cultures, and yet gospel writer Luke makes her the star in today's morality play. I think Luke is giving us a character who represents the victims of systemic oppression and showing us that the authentic ministry of those who claim to follow Jesus is to reach our hands out to help people stand up so that they can praise God, give thanks, and get moving for good. What do you think? That's another question we can ponder and share and talk about later. But one more thing about thinking. I think everyone's rejoicing in this story is not over the humiliation of opponents to this kind of empowerment. It is rejoicing because human beings realize the exciting potential when people are free of the institutionalized and societal systems that keep them in check while others live well. The eventual progression of realization that comes to common people from the Jesus story in this way is the triumphant story we have as resurrection. Like with the healing of the woman afflicted for 18 years, the point of Easter is not about breaking laws of physics. It is about breaking the ties of bondage that institutional inertia maintains. 
In our day, some of the ways we experience these restrictive systemic forces are sexism, heterosexism, white privilege, male privilege, institutional racism, internalized homophobia, oligarchy, cultural misogyny, economic inequality, human trafficking, and mass incarceration, just to name a few. Huh. Now, I'm not preaching that we as individuals or church com in church community or on our own can completely eradicate these conditions or solve all the problems that result from them. But I do hope that our society becomes aware enough to know what each of these kinds of conditions are and systems are so that like poison ivy and the plague, we can avoid them for ourselves and treat the symptoms when our friends and family are affected. Perhaps one by one, we can break free of these systems and stand up to walk into a new life thanking God. In you, Yahweh, I take shelter. Let me never be disappointed in your justice. Rescue me, deliver me, be mine, O mountain of strength. In connection with the goodness of that God, it is our mission to counteract the symptom, the symptoms and conditions that sicken people's spirits and keep them bent over double. There is no institutional justification stopping us. So let's keep trying to do what we can do to rejoice at the marvels Jesus inspires us to accomplish. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.